our seminar speaker for this evening, Dr. Constantine Ruthaus. Uh, Dr. Ruthaus is a assistant professor of biology at St. Joseph's College. Um, he's also an alum of our marine science program. He earned both his master's degree and his doc uh, doctorate um, at SOMA, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University. He also earned his uh, undergraduate degree in biology from Manhattan College. He's a marine ecologist and a conservation scientist, and his research focuses on natural and anthropogenic or human creative impacts on uh, coastal ecosystems and sustainable seafood production. And I think he'll emphasize the second part of those research interests tonight. So, okay. welcome, Dr. Rontos. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. I know we all probably had work and are having a long day, but I hope to pique your interest and so that you all walk out of here knowing something new about aquaculture and really why the U.S. has to grow with it. So I just want to start a little bit of a background of sort of where I came from and how I became interested in fisheries and in seafood production. This is my uncle right here, and my uncle was a fisherman in Boston, and that's a 750-pound bluefin tuna that he caught before I was even conceived, right? This is the mayor, because obviously if you catch a big fish, the mayor wants a picture, so then it goes then into the Boston Herald, right? So this was happening before I was around. And this photo right here, which this is not working now, so I'll just point, is actually my cousin-in-law in Greece about 10 years ago, who was an electrician by day, but when he was off his shift, he would go out on his boat to make a little extra money to catch fish to sell to the market. So seafood sort of has been all around my life, and growing up in Connecticut, far from the water, when I came to Long Island for graduate school, I was really, really felt at home because of the maritime culture that we have here, right? This idea of being a bayman or living off of the water really resonated with me. And I think it's one of our major characteristics as a community that sets us apart and makes us special. So what I'm going to go through today is really a discussion about food security and about the role fisheries can play, and by fisheries, both wild fisheries and aquaculture. Then I'll go into a case for offshore aquaculture, meaning aquaculture that takes place in federal waters or in areas where there is rapid flushing. Then discuss some of the challenges and step forwards which is more of a thinking exercise about where things are going, especially here in the U.S. So to begin, what is food security? Well, it technically is defined as existing when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and preferences for an active and healthy life. And what has been really the model that we have used to meet our growing populations and to provide food security? Well, modern agriculture has really been the model, okay? Modern agriculture depends on monocultures, single species that are cultivated over a wide range, and they utilize fossil fuels. They are heavy in land-intensive areas. They utilize a lot of fertilizers, nitrogen and phosphorus, pesticides and herbicides, fresh water to water all these crops. So this has really been the model to provide that amount of food that we need to meet the growing population. And really what have been the results from following this model, right? Well, we sort of see the results. And the results are that we see huge spatial inequalities of production and consumption. We still have about a billion people that are defined as undernourished. And more scary, we have about two billion people that are overnourished, meaning that are taking too many calories than is actually healthy. 
We see loss of food that has already been produced. In developing countries, we see about 40% of the food is lost at the processing stage, the storage or transport. And in developed countries, well, we know this because at the grocery store, we don't pick the cabbage that has that dark mark, right? 40% of the food is wasted at the retailer or the consumer level. I mean, we've all picked up an apple and looked at it all the way around to make sure it doesn't have a little brown spot, right? Those apples don't get sold. They get thrown out, unfortunately. Okay, in addition, we see food quality issues. We're now producing a lot of cheap, highly processed, nutritionally empty calories that are going into our cells and our youth. And we have about two billion people affected with micronutrient deficiencies, meaning some elements are deficient within them. In addition to this, again, all of these food items have generally been propagated through those monoculture type system, again, pe uh, pesticides, nutrients, heavy fresh water uses. So one of the sustainable development goals for 2030 is to conserve and sustainably use ocean, seas, and marine resources. And this is something that people at the international level, at the uh, federal level, at the state level, at the municipal level have been very interested in. So the question often comes, will the oceans help feed humanity? We have an estimated 9.6 billion people that'll be added to the world by 2050. Right now we're around 7.2 billion people. So the question becomes, are we gonna get more land to be able to grow our crops? Well, the answer is no, obviously, right? So how will we be feeding these people and will the oceans help us do this? Already, we see that there are a variety of countries throughout the world that produce a lot of protein, animal protein from the seas. It constitutes about 17% of all the animal protein consumed globally is from the seas or from uh, aquaculture. And why are aquatic food sources healthy and why are they good? Well, they represent one of the most beneficial food sources and we know from a variety of studies that they can reduce coronary heart disease. They can reduce the risks for other types of diseases as well. And in addition, because they have those micronutrients, they can provide a greater nutritional impact than the sum of the health benefits that you would get from taking vitamins separately. Climate change is a real thing. So we're also interested in a food system that has relatively low greenhouse gas emissions. So if we think about these different types of processes, extensive deep freezing, intensive deep freezing, take, poultry, all the way down, you see that seafood from fisheries, wild fisheries, this life cycle analysis shows that there's a very big range, but the majority of our wild fisheries are down here. Seafood from aquaculture, relatively uh, low on the greenhouse gas emissions per equivalent uh, kilogram of protein. So in terms of making choices about future and uh, future food production that has a low carbon footprint, we need to make sure we think about that. In addition, if you're talking specifically about marine aquaculture, guess what? You don't have to necessarily worry about the fresh water footprint that you have with a lot of crops or with uh, fresh water aquaculture. It's generally lower than terrestrial animal production, even when you include the different types of feeds that would go into those organisms. It still has a lower fresh water footprint. And that's important because there's a lot of scientists that are afraid that the next wars are not gonna be about territory, it's gonna be over access to fresh water. 
a very vital resource, an important resource. So wild fisheries, I often like to describe wild fish fisheries in this context because this is generally the dichotomy that you have with marine scientists. A glass half empty and a glass half full. And the idea being that you can look at the statistics and you can sort of say that things are going well or things aren't going well. And the major statistics, this is the uh, FAO State of Fisheries and Aquaculture Report, their most recent report. Right here is where you want to look at 2013. We see that you have about you know, 20% or so of all stocks are classified as overfished, meaning that we know as scientists and as mathematicians that we are fishing more of them than can replenish the population. The ones that are defined as fully fished, these are from a single species perspective. They're managed at what's known as MSY or maximum sustainable yield, right? We're fishing out the same number that are being recruited into the population so it's sustainable. And this amount here, the underfished, well this is the amount that we haven't yet developed our tastes for, okay, essentially. So you can look at this and say, well the majority, okay, nearly 90% of our stocks are either overfished or fished to their maximum. Or you can say, well, you know, 80% are fished sustainably or not fished at all, right? You can make both arguments from the same data. But we do know that wild catch catches haven't really increased since the 1990s. They've been relatively flat. So you can see, right, catches are not going up. And in addition, this recent paper, for the first time, estimated what the actual amount of discards are or illegal, unreported, uh, illegal, unreported uh, catches are as well. So they estimated here, we see where the catch level is. Okay, you can see that it's right about 140 uh, million tons. So aquaculture, conversely, hasn't stagnated. It's increased very rapidly. So aquaculture is up here in the white. Okay, and now, as of 2012 data, represents about 50% of the amount of catch uh, that's going to human consumption. So whereas these wild catches have stagnated, aquaculture has increased. And guess what? Humans' appetites haven't decreased, right? They've only increased. We're adding more humans. And developing nations that are becoming more and more developed, they want some of the fish too, right? They want access to this healthy and nutritious food as well. So when we look at the recent statistics from the FAO report, we can see, and you probably could figure it out, that at some point, there would be a switch to where the majority of seafood products that we would be eating are going to be farm-raised and not wild anymore. And guess what, folks? We have made that switch. As of about 2014, you, when you go to the markets, generally, are eating more farmed products from the ocean than wild products. Okay. I know it might be a little bit scary, but just think about this. When was the last time you ate a wild chicken? All right? You, it was probably a long time. It was probably your great ancestors. And by then, it didn't probably look like a chicken. It might have attacked them. Uh, so we've made that switch, right? We're now farming the oceans. And in addition, when we start thinking about the anticipated demand of seafood that humans are going to want, if we extrapolate that out, we have one study that looked at and assessed, a very recent study, that assessed where, where our fisheries are, and it's generally right there, less than 100 uh, million tons. The FAO projects 
that we're going to need around 187 million tons by 2025. Right? That's the projection of the amount of seafood that's going to be needed. Now, this Costello study also said, you know, what if we do everything right in our wild fisheries? What if all of these fisheries are managed to their full potential, right? What's the maximum amount that we can do by rebuilding our wild fisheries? The maximum amount that that does is gets you to about there, right? So then the question becomes, what's going to provide that protein? And that's actually one question. The second question is, where will that protein come from? Because somebody's going to provide that protein to those mouths. The question is, is it going to be in the US or will it be someplace else? So those are all important questions that we need to think about in terms of if the oceans will feed our future uh, population. So globally, this is what the picture is in terms of farm fish. All right, Asia is the dominant factor. Around 88% of all farm fish is being produced in Asia. Okay, small slivers in the Americas, in Africa, in Europe. Okay, the Americas about the same size as Africa. All right, about the same size of Europe. So this is where our farmed fish is coming from. And it makes sense because these ancient cultures, particularly China, and especially also in Egypt, they've been raising fish in captivity in sort of aquaculture ponds since the ancient days. So this has been part of their fabric for a very, very long time. Unfortunately, right, we are importing a lot of this seafood, and sometimes it might not be the best quality, or they may be have contamination. Right? This is from 2007, where the U.S. stopped some uh, seafood imports from China that were found to be contaminated right, with different types of chemicals. So it's very important to know where the U.S. imports its seafood from. In addition, I think it's an atrocity that the U.S. imports 90% of its seafood. Okay, so think about that. 90% of our seafood, guess what? It's not from your local baymen. It's not from your fellow baymen in other states. Okay, it's coming in from areas which may not have the federal regulation to regulate some of those contaminants. So, is there room for aquaculture to expand? This is just a map here from a technical report from the FAO looking at the amount of production per kilometer of coastline. And of these different countries, you'll notice there's a lot of green, right? There's only one red. A lot of them, over 51%, produce less than one ton per kilometer of coastline. It's a very, very small amount, okay? So if you think about where is there room for aquaculture, we have a lot of room for aquaculture in all of these different countries. Who will meet those demands? Where will these industries flourish? It's pretty much an open book. So when we try to rank things and we try to look at things, we can first see where there's the highest intensity of mariculture. China, of course, beats everybody, right? They are really producing a lot of farm fish. The U.S. is not even in the top 20, okay? And there's a lot of understandings about what coastal aquaculture looks like. And you know what? The early parts of coastal aquaculture, it was a learning period. Things were bad for the early part of the aquaculture industry for coastal aquaculture. And what do I mean by that? Well, farmers would put out net pens in areas that did not have great flushing. So what ends up when you're feeding organisms? Well, anybody who has a fish tank knows that the fish ultimately are going to deposit 
okay, the remnants of their uh, food someplace. So you can have coastal mariculture if, the, if it's not sited properly. You can have zones underneath where there is essentially a huge amount of organic material, which then leads to areas where there's not a lot of oxygen. In addition, early fish farming, particularly salmon, utilized a lot of drugs, a lot of nutraceuticals, okay, herbicides to kill off the following organisms that may be on the nets. So there was a lot to learn and a lot to uh, develop and a lot we have learned as an industry, offshore aquaculture as an industry, from coastal farming. So what are the main things that will determine the impact of a fish farm? Well, first is the type of cultivated organism, whether or not it's a fish, if it's a bivalve, it's a, if it's a shrimp, if it's a kelp, right? A kelp is able to sequester all the nutrients. A bivalve is able to fil filter out the phytoplankton, right? What's great about those species? Well, you don't have to spend money to feed them. They're naturally eating, right? Fish gets a little bit complicated. You do have to feed fish, right? You can't just leave them there. The location of the cultivation, whether or not you're in fresh water, in brackish water, or in marine water, the residence times of those bodies, the cultivated biomass, the number of species that you're raising, the quality and the quantity of the food you supply, and the management practices. Okay, are you managing intensively? Are you rotating? Uh, are you doing a semi-intensive type of uh, production? So, why should we go offshore? Well, there are several characteristics of offshore areas that are great for raising fish and are great for aquaculture. Particularly, there's not a lot of stakeholders out there. Right? In coastal areas, you have to deal with tourism, possibly, definitely sensitive ecosystems, trade ships, other types of conflicts potentially with fisheries. If you are out in federal waters, you have less stakeholders that are uh, possibly conflicting with you. In addition, recently the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management announced that they had a huge pot of uh, ocean for potential projects to solicit for energy. Right? Offshore energy and mariculture might be a good fit. And in Europe and the North Sea in particular, they have a term for this. Number one, they have the blue economy, but number two, they have marine clusters. This idea of clustering energy, clustering food production and things of that sort. So again, why offshore? Well, what I find most compelling is that you have improved water quality, which leads to improved fish quality. The fish are healthier out there. The fish are more nutritious because the water is better. In addition, of the studies that have evaluated the impacts of offshore aquaculture, okay, they found that there's negligible impacts on the benthos, on the water column, on the wild species. So let's look at a few different ones from this uh, NOAA technical memorandum that synthesized them. And if you guys uh, want, I'd be happy to share any of these papers or send them to you as well. Of these ones here, these are the three studies that have evaluated the impacts of offshore mariculture. All in areas, okay, or level of impact of none detected for dissolved nitrogen in the water column. And these were farms in Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, or Malta, offshore farms. In terms of dissolved phosphorus, which is not as important in marine ecosystems, but still detected in these studies, again, those offshore studies all had no detectable impacts to the water column. In terms of dissolved oxygen, okay, it's greater than five milligrams per liter, which is definitely suitable for fish, and in addition, most of the other studies, there was no issues at all 
with any uh, dissolved oxygen problems. What about chlorophyll A and what about phytoplankton populations developing from farming practices? Well, of the two studies that looked at them, okay, there were no detectable increases in chlorophyll A around the cages. And the term for this in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is oligotrophic, is that these nutrients, okay, become ghost nutrients because they're so rapidly incorporated by the phytoplankton there that those nutrients get sequestered and immediately move up the food chain. Okay, so ghost nutrients. So with this, okay, I got involved a while ago when I was finishing up my dissertation. I met somebody at a conference that was interested in offshore aquaculture. And I said, you know what? That sounds very intriguing. I'm interested in this idea and interested in, again, responsibly being able to produce seafood. So this idea for Mana Fish Farm to propose an offshore fish farm, right now our uh, area where we're in the pre-permitting phase for is around eight miles south of Shinnecock Inlet. And this project is known as Mana Fish Farms and the company is Mana Fish Farms Incorporated in which I serve as the director for research and development. So for me, I'm very interested in the research aspect. And why? Well, there's only three or four studies that have evaluated the impacts, the potential impacts of offshore aquaculture. We need a lot more studies in order to be able to tell if this is going to be the future of offshore aquaculture, right? We need, we're scientists, I'm a scientist, I need data, right? The only way you can get data is be able to test something. The only way you can be able to test something is to have something operational, okay? So it all fits together in terms of driving science, driving the industry, and uh, making sure things are being done responsibly. So Mana Fish Farm is an offshore integrated multi-trophic aquaculture firm, and we're striving to be the first open ocean farm on the east coast of the U.S. So currently, again, we're in the pre-permitting stages, and I'll go into the permitting stages, which I'm sure will give you guys nightmares, so maybe I shouldn't uh, do that. So there are three Ps in our model. Number one, all of our personnel and all of our employees have a passion for seafood and responsibly raise seafood. In addition, forming partnerships with universities, forming partnerships with NGOs, forming partnerships with local, state, federal agencies is very important because having an offshore fish farm means that if you're a scientist from University of New Hampshire or from SOMAS and you want to conduct a project, guess what? You have a platform to do that, okay? Because science helps industry and industry can help science. In addition, perseverance, okay, is a critical thing, especially when you are trying to really, uh, you know, be the first one out in our offshore area, okay? It's a very big step and nobody has done it so far. So, MANA's strategy utilizes a bunch of our resources, our community input, our strong academic credentials that we have here in Long Island and in the Northeast, commercial fisheries input, and political input, again, at all the different levels of government. We have received a capital equipment grant from the New York Empire State uh, Empire Development funds in order to help facilitate some of our development. So these are all positive things moving us in the right direction to become established. And what is the actual technology? Well, these are the actual cages. These are two different types of cages that are suitable for offshore aquaculture. So this one here is the aquapod, and this is a geodesic sphere steel sphere uh, with steel mesh 
okay, copper mesh sometimes panels you can have. These cages are submersible, which means that the cages are not at the surface. So you bring the cages down, and what that does, those of you who have take, remember physical oceanography, right, you can have a hurricane going over you, and that energy from the hurricane, once you get down, you know, 10 meters or so, that energy is basically done. So the fish could be below anything that's happening on the surface and be perfectly fine. In addition, this eliminates 99.9% .9 of potential people interacting with your fish at the surface. So these are the two different types of, uh, of uh, cages that are there. They are currently in operation in farms in Baja, Mexico, and also in Panama. And the idea is that certain fish might grow better in certain types of cages. They're very expensive, right? So you, you know, so you want to make sure your cages are treating your fish well. Very important. And I mentioned multi-trophic aquaculture, right? And some of you may not know what that means, but ultimately the goal is to have your fish culture also associated with bivalves, either mussels or a scallop. There's a Japanese technique now where you can have sea scallop by cutting a little paper, uh, paper hole in the side and stringing them up. So you have your bivalves which remove the particulate organic matter produced from the fish, and then you have your dissolved inorganic uh, nutrients being sequestered by seaweeds. So this idea of polyculture, being able to incorporate all of those different things so it minimizes any potential impacts on the environment. Okay, so what are some challenges and steps forward? Well, there's really, I'd say a clear, uh, a lack of clear permitting, right? There actually was no permitting process when we first started and approached uh, some of the government agencies. The first meeting was sitting around the table and saying, okay, well, who's the lead agency? Well, you're the lead agency because of this. No, but you're the lead agency because of this. Uh, so eventually it was established who the lead agency was. But that shouldn't necessarily be how things are, right? There should be a, a plan in place, especially as NOAA has been promoting aquaculture development for about 30 years. It's actually in legislation that we should be supporting aquaculture development. But what has happened? Aquaculture development here in the U.S. currently only supports 5% of our seafood demand. Right? It hasn't increased. So 20 years or 30 years hasn't provided any clear permitting process. The one thing I will say is that NOAA has released a plan for offshore aquaculture development in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so there is a plan there, there is a permitting process there. It hasn't made its way into the other different areas of the U.S. And in addition, this is just, this was a review article with just some of the different, uh, different issues, different laws, and different agencies that need to be contacted for different things. So it's a bear of permitting, a bear of all of these different things in order to, again, get established. The second is public perception, right? And in the U.S. and particularly in North America, we don't like aquaculture. Okay, maybe in Long Island we like, you know, raising our oysters or like raising our clams, all right? But Aquaculture for fish is still, still has a negative connotation. And for good reason, because salmon, when coastal salmon started, there were uh, data gaps, there were things that were bad of it. Farm salmon now has made tremendous leaps from where it was, okay? But this is still persisting in a lot of people's minds. Right, but that's, the not, that's not the current image of the aquaculture industry 
especially in areas that have very good and very tough government regulations. So this was a report released by the FAO addressing the perceptions and misconceptions of aquaculture. And they can be summed up in this little schematic here. Okay. The perceived risks and benefits. One of the major things that people were concerned about is, is it healthy? Okay. Then the next thing that they were concerned about is not where it was, but how expensive was it? Okay, so let's all think about ourselves when we go to the supermarket, right? Well, we want to know if it's healthy, of course, right? But then, uh, hey, that's a little bit cheaper there. Okay, maybe we'll try it. Uh, so all of these different factors play into it. The demographics of where you're from, whether or not you eat a lot of seafood or not. Uh, the local regional context, the importance of aquaculture to your local economy can also be very important, and I have an example of that there. So all of these factors shape your per perception of aquaculture. And in North America, out of all these other regions in the globe, we have some of the you know, worst perception of fish farms. In addition, if you look at some of the journals that are dedicated to food security, nobody talks about the oceans, okay? It's actually something that I think is very, very wrong, that you have food security journals that aren't mentioning some of the most nutritious sources of food for people. What about education? Well, if you look at Kaplan online or if you look at Princeton Review and you want to learn about aquaculture, guess what? You're looking about you know, 10 schools and the majority of them are gonna be learning how to raise catfish and recirculating tanks. Right? One or two possibly in New Hampshire is starting a aquaculture program. Okay, you have University of Miami and then you have that possibly. Right? So there's no real way of getting students interested in an industry which has the science, which has the technology, which has the engineering and the mathematics. In addition, what about the kids? What about the children? This was produced by the FAO for World Food Day in October. So you're thinking, okay, FAO talks about uh, why aquaculture is important. It says that aquaculture is going to meet the seafood demand. What do they tell the kids? Well, they tell the kids all of these different things, which are great. I love the illustrations. But there's no aquaculture in there at all. Right? So I don't understand this. Right? This is a report for children. And aquaculture is not even one of the things. So these types of things are very interesting and this is where education needs to get to children, right? Children should learn about it. And in New York State we have the Common Core and my wife's a math teacher so I know all about the Common Core, right? And her uh, sixth grade class, the ELA class portion, was, had to choose some books and one of the books was Mark Kurlansky's World Without Fish. So my wife did a statistic, a fish statistics part for the math portion, but they read this book. And in this book, there's one page about aquaculture, basically saying that all aquaculture is bad. So uh, if you have sixth graders that are reading it part for the common core, right, they're going to think about aquaculture and think about it in a negative light. Right, which is not really justified and it's not really correct. Right? We should expand their eyes and we should expand uh, what they should be exposed to in terms of thinking about things. What about job skills? Right? This is an article from last month's Fisheries Magazine, the magazine of the American Fisheries Society. Are we preparing the next generation of fisheries professionals to succeed in their careers. And you know, you can look at it one way, what I looked for in particular, right? 
they ask them, what is the importance of knowledge of these topics and contributing to successful careers? Okay, one is not important at all. 10 is very important. For aquaculture, across the board, it had the lowest scores. So for the importance for undergrads, for individuals with a master's degree, with doctoral degrees, faculty, state workers, federal workers, skills in aquaculture was very, very low. Wasn't really desired, wasn't important for their job training. So how well do U.S. university uh, curricula prepare students for these? As you can imagine, right, well, if you only have a few programs and they're not desired for jobs, our U.S. universities are not really preparing students for these careers, for these STEM careers, for this potentially growing industry. So again, if the U.S. federal government wants to promote the development of aquaculture in the U.S., we're not educating our youth. We're not providing higher education that, that gives them instruction. And we're not providing them with jobs. So that's why there's no aquaculture industry in the US, because we're not facilitating one to grow. If you go to China, I'm sure every university has aquaculture courses or some kind of aquaculture training. Right? So it's a mind shift change in changing how we will approach it. Because again, we will be eating farmed fish in the future. The question is, will they be US farmed fish or will we continue to import the farmed fish? So this is touching on one of my first projects that I did as a master's student in Greece. And this was about 2008 when I was over there. And during that time, okay, Greece had made the switch from aquaculture production, okay, surpassing wild fish production. And I remember I was very fortunate to be able to go with my family every few years growing up. And my cousin, cousin-in-law that you saw on the first slide, second slide, right? I just remember being at the kitchen table and every time we had dinner or we met, there were just less and less fish, less and less fish, right? So this flip happened, and I remember when the first farmed fish came to the market, right? People didn't really know what to do, okay? So these fish came to the market, and you always gauge things based on the grandmothers, Right, so if the Yaya's don't like this farmed fish product, you know, then you don't like it. Right? If they like it, then it's okay. Well, after a few more years of no wild fish coming to the food markets, coming to the fish shops, right, then people bought onto it and realized that this was going to be the new, uh, the future for at least the Eastern Mediterranean. And it ended up being more nutritious for them. It ended up being more stable. They were able to actually get fish in stable quantities. It wasn't fast or famine. And in addition, we talk about the economic recession, but the aquaculture industry in Greece in particular was one of the keys to getting them out of the economic recession. Because they are, Greece and Turkey in particular, are providing seafood to all of Europe. And they, you know what, they do a really good job. Their uh, farmed fish is really good. Sea bream and sea bass in particular. So aquaculture can serve as an economic engine in working waterfronts, okay, that have the infrastructure, that have the facilities, and that have the expertise and the culture and the ethic of working with seafood. So what are some of the keys that I would like to end with in terms of the future for sustainable seafood? Seafood consumption will continue to be an important component of global food security. Aquaculture will continue to meet this demand, but it must do so sustainably. And it will do it sustainably if you allow it to grow in areas that have the regulation. 
We also at the same time need to heal and restore our coastal ecosystems. That is vital as well. Responsibly raised seafood that is locally produced needs to be encouraged, right? We talk about local kale or local farmers markets. Why not local seafood? Why should we have to get our seafood from China when we could possibly get it in our local waters? And finally, revitalize our working waterfronts, get people to get into working with the bay that they've done, to, done so for for many, many years. So with that, I would like to thank you all very much. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. Thank you. Yeah, so our first fish that we are planning on raising would be striped bass. And striped bass, because they do well in our waters, they're a native, they're actually the state saltwater fish. Okay, like Massachusetts has the cod, we have the striped bass. Uh, so it does well in our waters. The cages, around 70 feet in diameter. So they're large geos geodesic spheres. And in terms of tonnage, that has to get worked out based on the currents uh, so that we can make sure that they have maximum growth rate. Yeah. So are striped bass native? Yes. How do you handle those? Uh, so this cage is, is suspended and fish have no problem schooling in there. Uh, so the fish will have no problem schooling in there. They have these different types of pods have been used in other areas in Malta, for instance, uh, for tuna. Okay, so tuna is a much larger pelagic species. And it's quite mesmerizing. The fish will just be happy going around in circles. Yeah. Has uh, genetic variation ever been an issue with farming the fish? Well, so with any type of farming, right, that's a great point because people always ask that. What did farmers do for our crops? Right? We selected for traits that we desired. So, you know, there's, again, from the salmon perspective, right, people were very afraid of genetically modified salmon. Well, you get the same results if you artificially select salmon to grow at faster rates. And actually, our former dean, David Conover, showed that if you manipulate and artificially select silver sides, you can make them be very large or very small based on selecting those individuals. So again, it's farming and you can select uh, traits that you, that you prefer. So it doesn't have to be involved. species that you can constantly be able to get brood stock, make sure that that fish is not something you're different. Okay, and brood stock management is an essential component of any fish farm. Yeah. Thank you, Captain, for taking the time. Thank you for coming. submerged, right, and what we do have from the University of New Hampshire is a 20-ton feed buoy, okay, so this is a large buoy that will have uh, actual straws, if you think of them, going into the cages, and periodically they'll turn off and turn on and turn off. Now, one of the major costs, about 50 to 70 percent of the cost of a fish farm, guess what it is? It's the feed that you're feeding the fish. Okay, so making sure you're very diligent about how much feed is in there is crucial. And what works is having cameras throughout the pod so that when you turn on the pellets, you can see when the fish stop eating as aggressively and then you can turn it off. That minimizes the amount of feed that goes outside the cage. Now, at least in my experiences from being in Greece, 
and diving at these coastal cages uh, when it was feeding time. Once they turned on the feeding thing and, and the fish heard the vibrations, it wasn't just the fish that were in the pens that got excited. All the other fish came swarming in because they knew that they could get a pellet if it you know, went through the cage. And then the other tunas knew that because then they could eat. You know, so it's, 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 it's well managed. You don't want to waste feed. What is the composition of the feed? The composition of the feed depends on the species, but uh, there's another aspect where there's been tremendous gain. In the past, you might have heard, or probably some of you might might be in your textbooks, about a five to one ratio, right? It takes five kilograms of a forage species to equal one kilogram of a farm salmon. Largely due to market conditions, because fish meal and fish oil are so high, it's now at one to one, or even less than one to one. Now with substituting uh, soy and other type of terrestrial protein. Okay, and the idea is that you can do that and then right before the fish will go to market, then you provide them with a lot more fish oil and, and fish meal, so that way they get you know, sort of that consistency that's desired. Yeah? Why don't they just farm poachers, which is what they do? Yeah, yeah, good I question. Mean, I mean, does the finishing diet to make sure that they get the oils and stuff that they need. So there are papers coming out every day assessing, <coughs> you know, how to minimize and be very, very careful with the amount of protein uh, that you're given, but still make it be something that people desire. Yeah, so they, a lot of them, they do it on purpose uh, to make sure that the salmon are fertile. Okay, and that's just so they don't invest in, in their uh, reproductive development. Okay, so a lot of times they'll, um, but in terms of the stripers and stuff here, they'll be in market before they get to a size that, that would really have any Uh, for them to be fertile. So you do always want to keep individuals as broodstock, so to become spawners, to provide them with the next generation of fish. Okay, but in terms of raising it, uh, raising the fish, you want to get them to the market size as quickly as possible. Um, you know, that's the major consideration. You know, it's not like a spa for the fish. You're ultimately going to Yeah, so great question. There's actually a diamond in the rough on the east end, which uh, is a f fish farm for striped bass that's been in operation for about 30 years. Um, and they will be able to provide fingerlings for us. We're not releasing you know, striped bass eggs into the water. Uh, so you'd be growing them in hatcheries at, uh, at this fish farm in Narragansett or at the University of New Hampshire also has a, a striped bass facility, or potentially, you know, here in Long Island, if, if there's a suitable demand. Yeah. Have you entered uh, Huh? Are you using antibiotics? We plan on not using antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. If you were to use it, how would you approach it? Well, I can ask you. We have our veterinarian right here. He'd be able to uh, give you the lowdown. <laughs> Go ahead. Who has a question? Yeah. Uh, so generally when antibiotics are delivered to fish in a, in a farm situation, the, the antibiotic is compounded into the, the pellet of the feed. So you have, you have, to, order, you have to order it. And, and the issue is you really have to kind of plan ahead or you're going to be behind whatever the disease outbreak is. So, so generally, management strategy Biosecurity, keeping the diseases off the farm is what you know what, what 
we attempt to do when we're trying to grow fish because antibiotics are super expensive. We as veterinarians don't have a lot of choices. Right now, I think there's only four antibiotics that are actually labeled for use in pin fish, and none of them are labeled for striped bass at this point. So there might be an issue using those antibiotics. Uh, so that's all something that, that has to take into consideration when you're thinking about the, the health management of, uh, of a, especially a, a new species, a species that, well, I don't want to call it a new species, but um, taking a species that, that we understand a little bit about and moving on to it, no, into a whole new environment and a whole new situation. Yeah. So the main around the sides of the cages. So, for instance, if there's a harmful algal bloom in, in, in uh, Asia, sometimes there are harmful algal blooms, and they're able to put flaps down on the sides of their coastal pens and draw water from the bottom, and that prevents the harmful algal bloom from actually killing the fish. So they've lost, they've had bad uh, losses with harmful algal blooms uh, and fish there. But the main thing to keep down is keep down fish stress. The fish aren't stressed, and if they are healthy, which they generally are, in offshore conditions, you're not going to have any disease problems. But we do have contingency plans. Yeah. So when you harvest them, these geodesic spheres can actually inflate, so they'll come up to the surface, and when you harvest it, it's almost like an egg, you open the top of the egg shell, and you can extract the fish there with other nets. So there's really no chance, again, these are steel panels, no chance of predators getting in, no chance of fishes escaping, okay, unless somebody drops it from the net, but it's all above, above uh, the water. So when you harvest it, that's how you will. So you need a special equipment to do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean we'll have a we'll have a boat that has cranes and uh, these operate generally by different uh, floating bladders or one mile high hydraulics that bring up the cages. Any question out there? In terms of at the you know first level, right? Well, you're going to be developing and making sure you have infrastructure on land, right? And fortunately, we well fortunately or unfortunately, we have a lot of suitable marine space that is currently not working, right? So getting those facilities and getting that land to be functional to have employees there uh, is a good thing, right? So developing hatcheries onshore to provide jobs. It would provide opportunities to grow out these fish. Those fish would need to be fed, and a lot of times those feeds can be, you know, can be used with natural water running in to feed the larval stages because they eat zooplankton that are in the water anyways. And that's a model really that they uh, tend to do also in Malta. Okay, when they just hatch out, when they're really small, that's typically when you see a lot of mortality, but you can have the local waters actually filtering it. And then we eat a lot of our primary production that we have in our bays too. So, you know, is there an impact? Yeah, if as a developing industry increases, there would be a footprint, but the idea is that, you know, uh, it would be done in a responsible way with the community on board, with everyone on board, and it would be ultimately you know, productive for everyone. So in China, the majority of their farm fish is carp. It's freshwater. And then the next to that, we're talking about the shrimp and brackish water pond. Let's take a couple more questions over here. Yeah. What are your thoughts about uh, the um, advantage of eventually developing a sustainable ecosystem within that by utilizing solid substrates such as
Well, so, th so that's a, a very interesting point. So these actually serve as fish aggregating devices and actually are in themselves these little ocean ecosystems. And if you think about it, the fish that are around these cages, guess what? They can't be fished because you know, there's too much gear in the air. So essentially, there's a few studies in Greece again that showed that fish farms, because they're closed off for fishing, actually serve as marine protected areas. Okay, except for the farm employees who maybe occasionally, when they're on break, will go spear fishing. Okay. Yes. standard in the past for salmon was five to one. That's been reduced largely to one to one. Okay? For wild fish, the conversion factor is around 10 to one. Okay, so it takes 10 kilograms of capelin for every one kilogram of cod. Whereas in a farm setting, it would be a much better ratio. And the reason why is because that's a wild fish. To move, it has to swim, it has to move from predators, right? So it has all these other concerns. Whereas a farm fish, uh, they can relax, they can just sort of enjoy. Uh, so more of their energy from the fish is going into their growth rather than into their metabolism. nice about these offshore cages is that generally any whale entanglements have to do with lax growth. Okay, things that are not very tall. These cages, all the wires and all the steel cables are very tall. So the chances of any whale entanglement is basically
Thank you.